Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our town hall on disabilities rights and what and things that we can do to build a new, more accessible America, actions that we can be taking. We have some incredible guests today. My name is Tisa Rodriguez. I'm the chair of the Riverside County Democratic Party. First, I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping and we'll introduce you to our wonderful speakers. Um, first, I'd like to welcome you all. We have people today here on Zoom, Facebook Live, Twitter, YouTube, and Twitch. Everyone who is on Zoom, except for the speakers, will be muted today, but you can type your questions in the chat box. We also have people checking the, the, the Facebook feed, so if you type your questions in there, we will make sure we get to them and we get answers for you and uh, can have a little bit of discussion. So now I'm going to introduce you to our speakers today. Amanda Seavey was born in Beaverton, Ohio, Beaverton, Oregon, sorry. Um, in college, she worked on international relations, sociology, Spanish, and immigration studies. While working on her paramedic certificate, she fell at work and became permanently disabled from reflex sympathetic dystrophy. Um, she has managed small business, including restaurants, and sought the Democratic nomination for Oregon's first congressional district. In 2020, her primary disability rights platform was adopted by Bernie Sanders, Leo Mamara, and many others. We have Chanel Patel with us. Chanel yeah, Pittman, I apologize so much. Chanel Pittman with us is, is a 28-year-old resident of Los Angeles. She was diagnosed with cerebral palsy and could not walk unsupported until the age of eight. She became an organizer for Wolfpack in 2011 and is now the Young Eco-Socialist Outreach um, and Accreditation Co-Chair for the Greens and a member of her, her state party coordinating committee. In 2020, she ran for California's 34th Congressional District on a Green New Deal, Single Health Payer, and Federal Jobs Guarantee Plan. Kate Schwartz uh, may join us in a little bit. She's not here yet, though, but she is a behavioral therapist has, uh, in his, the Assembly District 8075, who was endorsed by the Democratic Party. She has been a behavioral therapist for over 25 years and owns a practice and works in the community. Liz Lavertu is with us today. She's a mother, a mother, a small businesswoman, and the chair of the Spring Valley Community Planning Group. She's been an active volunteer in her community for over 20 years. Liz is running for state assembly to advocate for working families and push for policies that help shape our education, healthcare, and the environment. She's running in the 71st Assembly District that's in East County, San Diego, Idlewild, Anda, Valley Vista, Sage, and more. Leah Mamara is a history professor from a working class family of union laborers. Liam has worked as a union longshoreman, union fry cook, and a computer nerd. He later took on a lot of student debt to finish his PhD. Liam has taught college for 12 years and focuses on the history of ideas. He is a Democratic nominee for the U.S. Congress in the 42nd Congressional District and lives in Southwest Riverside County. So now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go first to, uh, officially today, our correspondent in the field, Liz Lavertu, see if she can go with us. Uh, as she's out there uh, working on some of the social justice issues. It, and so let's see if she's here. Liz, welcome. Yeah, hey everyone. Hi, I'm Liz Libertu, running for the 71st Assembly District in East County. Um, I'm gonna be brief today. This uh, you know, is an issue very close to my heart. Um, I'm a mother of two boys, both who um, have IEPs at school. My oldest son uh, was born blind and I had to fight and advocate for things that the school should have done from day one. Um, you know, having to get so many doctors' notes and having to advocate for him, you know, throughout the years, it it shouldn't happen. We should have, you know, laws in place to help, you know, our children uh, during the edge. For those of you who don't know, um, when you uh, have an IEP. It's a it's a special like instruction program, special instruction uh, you know uh, program education that they deserve. Well, when you transition schools, and my son is you know graduating, getting promoted from eighth grade and going into high school, there's a transition meeting. But this year, due to COVID, um, some of the school districts are not having transition meetings for their students, meaning that all the things that the resource teachers and everything know at one school that 
they've learned through the years to help him is not going to be communicated to the next school. And so he's going to be behind at the beginning of the school year. So that's something that I'm currently advocating and fighting for in my son's school district right now. But I'm just very happy with the speakers that we have on today. And um, I support everything that they're talking about because we all, you know, need to support uh, everybody. Um, and that's why I'm kind of out here on the streets right now. And sorry, um, I didn't expect for this protest to be going on so long, but there are literally thousands and thousands and thousands of people in San Diego right now um, protesting. So thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and I will uh, hopefully be on later with you guys but uh, cell service is really hard right now. And I'll put out a uh, official post on my Facebook um, at Liz Liberty for Assembly later today about uh, disability rights and my stance on it. So um, again, uh, good seeing you all and you guys have a great day. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Can we go to Amanda CB? Thank you. Hi guys. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, We've had over 40 congressional and state and local candidates about our disability rights platform, including Bernie Sanders. Um, and I really wanted to take a couple minutes and go through that platform, talk about some of the changes that we need as a community to improve our quality of life, our functionality, and our ability to live as part of our society. Um, so yeah, so I'm just going to go ahead and go through it. Uh, the first one, it is still legal to pay disabled people less than minimum wage just because they're disabled. And we need to end that. We need to end all exceptions for workplace. Uh, we need to all end all exceptions for wage laws and workplace protections for those with disabilities and ensure that they can have a job where they're able to function and provide that, that quality of life uh, and receive a minimum living wage, just like everybody else. Another thing that we need is expanded social security, supplemental social income and social security disability. Right now, these programs are one, they're really hard to get onto. It can take years to get onto social security disability. And that's not right. And while you're on waiting to get approved for social security disability, you're on supplemental social income, if you're lucky. And that only provides $700 a month. Right now, the minimum wage uh, that you can get on social security disability is $750 a month. And that's what I live off of. And it's wrong. Nobody can survive on that. And so we need to do better. We need to bring these up to living wage programs because if we do that, it won't just increase the quality of life for 81 million people across this country, but it will reduce our homelessness rate by over half. Because right now, 40% of our homeless population and 30% or 40% of our homeless population are disabled and 30% are over the age of 65. And we need to do better to ensure that everybody has a basic quality of life. Um, so we need to definitely bring those up to living, to living wage programs. Um, and again, expand the access to those programs because Nobody should have to fight for things that we've paid into for our entire lives. You pay into social security from the moment you get your first job. And if you become disabled young, you are stuck on those same basic wages for the rest of your life. Right now, I have no ability to make it past $750 a month. I have no ability to work. And I'm gonna be stuck on this starvation wage for the rest of my life, and it's wrong. There are millions of people out there that are on the streets because they don't get enough from social security disability. So we need to do better as a society. Uh, we need to implement and adopt the Americans with Disability Act. I mean, we need to ensure that we close all those loopholes and close the fact that businesses were able to be grandfathered in to a ADA that was not meant to work for everybody. You still have parts of our society and our country that are inaccessible to those with disabilities. We have most houses have at least one step. If you become disabled and you own a house, you're either gonna have to make expensive uh, upgrades or you're gonna have to move and it's wrong. We need to start ensuring that 
every new construction is accessible to those with disabilities. We need to make sure that there are placards out there for those that are visually impaired and that there's ways for them to get around and function because I know how hard it is for me in a wheelchair. I couldn't imagine doing it without my eyes. And we need to do better as a society. Stop signs in traffic. I mean, the, the uh, how must we say, the um, public transportation, waiting for a stop and you can't even see what bus is coming. We need to do better and have voice activated uh, stops and interactive signs at every single stop. We need to have ramps. We need to have make sure that the ramps meet ADA standards and they're not too steep, that doors aren't too heavy, that tables aren't too heavy, that chairs aren't too high, that tables aren't too high. There's so much better we can do and we're just leaving a major part of our population out. One in five people in our country live with a disability and yet we never discuss it. So we need to do better about that. And part of that comes with increased education. We need to make sure that uh, ASL is an option at every school, that we have students that can learn these languages and interact with members of our society because ASL is not an optional thing for some people. It's a mandatory thing and we need to be able to to communicate with them, including police departments, social workers, our government officials. We need to do better, and the way we do that is by teaching people young. Uh, we need to ensure that family caregivers and expanded uh, hours so that people have the ability to stay in their homes and maintain independence. We need to ensure that these things are covered by Medicare for All. Uh, we need that single payer health care program that Chanel has been campaigning for and I have been campaigning for and Liam has been campaigning for. And we've all been fighting for because we know that the system as it is now is not working. We need a system that includes medical marijuana. I mean, because that is a medication that is so life saving. Um, it needs to be covered under Medicare for all because I know there are patients out there that are spending thousands of dollars a month just to get their medication. And that's not right. And it should be, if we're using it to replace pharmaceutical medications, like most of us are, I used it to replace 10 of my own medications, then we need to ensure that it is covered by those insurance companies and by Medicare for all in particular because that's what we need. We shouldn't have patients fighting for healthcare coverage that should come standard and should cover the whole body. I mean, nobody should have teeth like this. It's not fun, it's not pretty, and it shouldn't happen. And even though I have three insurance program or coverage companies right now, three insurance policies, not one of them covers that aspect of my disability. So we need to make sure that the entire body is covered by these programs. Eyes, ears, nose, everything. It's all covered. Um, and that it also covers accessibility and adaptability equipment. There are so many people that cannot function without a wheelchair or without a walker, without a cane, or without a, a braille machine, or without a phone that talks to you or light switches that you know, it's just, we have so many needs and they should be covered. They shouldn't have to fight for something that would make our lives livable. I was on Oregon Health Plan and I couldn't get a wheelchair covered because I didn't need it to live inside my house. I needed it to live outside my house. And they didn't care about that. It's just basic functionality that they cover and it's not good enough. So we need to make sure that these wonderful life-saving adaptive equipments are available to everybody as part of our Medicare for All program and that it covers the service animals that we need to live and function because these animals are our body and if our bodies are covered then the animal 
that protects us and gets us around and helps us function should be covered too. Um, sorry, I have a whole lot of notes. It was a, and I'm going to try to make it through as much as I can. Um, we need to ensure that those who live in assisted living facilities don't have their possessions or property taken away when they die, that that stuff goes to their family members. Uh, we need to ensure that we have a national death with dignity law and that we can live with dignity and die with dignity. And it's our choice how we live and die. And we need to ensure that that is a right ensured to all people. Uh, we need to ensure that opiate pain management is something that patients who need it have access to. Right now we have millions of patients across the country who are being denied this life-saving medication just because there is a problem with illicit fentanyl and heroin. So we need to stop the stigma, realize where the problem is, and allow the patients that need these medications to have them. Because when we take them away, all we're doing is driving patients to the bottle, the street, or suicide as means of pain management, and that's nowhere near good enough. Um, what else do we have? We need to increase employment and educational opportunities and social opportunities with those with disabilities. We need to uh, ratify the convention of the rights of the persons with disabilities. We need to create and implement educational programs for an accessibility for industries, including but not limited to healthcare, education, construction, police, government employees, and service industries. So many people don't understand how to interact with disabled people because we keep them segregated. We keep them in different classrooms. We keep them in different jobs, in different housing, and it's wrong. We should live and function and be with everybody else. And the only way our community is gonna get the changes that we need is if we start living with everybody. If you start seeing us out in society, if you start appreciating and understanding and asking questions. That's how we make change. We need to change our policing system because half of all those killed by police have disabilities. They're teaching our police how to interact with the disabled community because I'm sick of seeing our mute and deaf brothers and sisters who go to sign to a police officer getting arrested or beaten or maimed, anything else. It's ridiculous. They should understand what is going on when they see somebody trying to assign to them. And it's, we shouldn't have police pushing over wheelchairs in the street. We shouldn't have police pushing over elderly people in the street. It's, it's wrong. They need to understand that our adaptive equipment and these wheelchairs are our body and they can't just grab it and push it and they can't just move us away and out of their way. We need to do better educating people and uh, we need to increase research and funding for our conditions and the conditions that we live with and for our treatments. We need to focus on cures instead of treatments because treatments keep us sucking at the wonderful tit of pharmaceutical companies forever. We need to start investing in medications and cures rather than those wonderful pharmaceuticals that keep piling on and piling on and piling on because the pharmaceutical companies get kickbacks, doctors get kickbacks for prescribing them. And we need to change the entire way our system is funding these medications and funding these uh, the research and funding these uh, pharmaceuticals and the way that we are selling these pharmaceuticals too, because you should not have pharmaceutical reps on commission. That's a drug dealer. Um, we should not have pharmaceuticals reps that are getting paid money to push drugs and not caring who they're affecting, who's getting those drugs, where they're going. We need to start taking care of patients as a priority and not the profits. The profits are what we need. Um, we need to forgive all that wonderful medical debt that those with disabilities and patients 
across the board have from years of that profit over people. Um, we need to do a straight forgiveness, a jubilee year with all that debt because nobody should get hurt at work and end up with $500,000 worth of medical debt. It's ridiculous. Nobody should get hurt or get sick and end up bankrupt. Nobody should get hurt or get sick and end up on the street. We need to do better as a society. And part of that is also removing the, the decriminalizing and legalizing medical marijuana, not just covering it by insurance, but removing the entire criminalization and doing a full legalization of these med of this wonderful, important medication. And we need to look into other ones, such as psilocybin, and see what medical uses those can have, because it's a huge thing. It's a huge industry, and there are some amazing research being done, and we need to be able to do that research, which means we need to deschedule these drugs and legalize these drugs and have these drugs owned by the people. Um, so, yeah, I know. I'm sorry. I'm taking a lot of time. I don't want to take any more. But, um, no, that's, that's, that's perfectly wonderful. We really, we really want to hear about this. But um, let's go through a few more introductions, and we really want to be able to get into some of these questions deeper so we can, can get some of the, the knowledge out so people can be educated. Um, so, so for the moment, let's go to our next speaker. And I, I sincerely apologize for butchering your name earlier, but it's Chanel Pittman. Um, I've been at this too many hours today. And um, you could please share with us and just share some of your experience and, uh, and your knowledge as well. And I'm sure everyone at home and on the, you know, out there on the internet is, is really seeing all the, all of the knowledge that they're really receiving today. It's amazing. I'll do my best, thank you. As stated, my name is Chanel Pittman. Um, I am a member of the Green Party. I've been disabled since birth. It's actually kind of beautiful to be here in a conversation where you have someone that's you know, been disabled since birth next to someone who has an acquired disability. Because the thing about being a disabled person or becoming a disabled person is that's it's the only condition safe of being that you can acquire, which is why it's very critical in my view, in the view of a lot of people, that you know, you have to care about accessibility because of the fact that anyone at any time for any reason can become completely unable to function by quote unquote normal society standards. I mean, I have friends who were otherwise completely normal but they had one bad reaction to a painkiller hit their head and now they have post-concussion syndrome the things that you have to go through as a disabled person when no one knows what's wrong is the most like dehumanizing stressful I don't even know how to explain how much it hurt to have friends and relatives literally acquire a concussion that didn't heal properly and then being told for years and years and years that you're making up what's wrong with you. You're saying that you're, you're saying I'm weak, I'm dizzy. Oh, you're just trying to get out of doing homework. One of my nieces is epileptic and she had a fall because of her seizures and now she has post-concussion syndrome. The post-concussion syndrome symptoms have made it to where she's a couple of, she's a, about a grade or so behind just because all the school she had to miss dealing with seizure medication and, you know, post-concussion syndrome symptoms. Um, I started life at disabled school because I was born with CP, so I went to two schools that were specifically designed for disabled students. Middle school was a scary transition because the No Child Left Behind Act forced us to suddenly go to schools in districts where we, where we lived versus being able to be bussed out to schools that better served the needs of us as disabled children. So I went from a school that was kind of well-funded, directly designed for disabled children, where everyone at the school knew how to deal with cerebral palsy and ADHD and all the other things that disabled 
students typically have to a school like right near me where people had no idea what to do. Either I was fragile and not able to do anything or I was expected to do everything despite the fact that, you know, certain things just did not click well for me. I have no known intellectual problems, but everyone struggles if you can't write fast enough to get the notes down. I mean, I'm fortunate in that I had access to certain things because I had an IEP from scratch. But you know, not every student is, is, that, is that fortunate. And I mean, when I sit down and I look at what disabled kids and people in general are going through these days, I'm freaking out because people with intellectual disabilities lose their right to vote. I'm freaking out because small autistic children and children with disabilities that make them a little bit, um, a little bit intense sometimes get put into isolation and literally locked in dark rooms because they're having moments and the people don't know how to deal with it. And for some reason, this is low key acceptable. I mean, if we went down and did the statistics for the amount of disabled students that got in school suspension, where basically you are being told you're bad, you've been bad at school, so now we're going to have you stay in school because we can't send you home, but you're not going to go to class. Good luck finishing your work. When you do that to a kid that is disabled or just struggling because poverty, how are they supposed to finish school? Hairspray is not supposed to... The situation that people put people in a hairspray is not supposed to be real life. For those of you that don't know the hair for, hairspray reference, all the black kids in hairspray were sent to detention because the teachers didn't want to deal with them because they were black. So they were all like held behind for years. This sort of thing happens or can happen with kids who are disabled. And some of them in certain states, you get to a certain age, whether you've met your requirements to get out of school or not, they kick you out of school because you're too old. Um, there are various things that I could speak on. I mean, one of the other things that I was running on was the notion of the corporate death penalty, because I want companies that do harm to people to lose their charter because of the things they've done. For my, for my end on that, my dad was exposed to um, Agent Orange, and it caused me to have polycystic ovarian syndrome. Now, that means that I'm probably going to have even more of a struggle when it comes time for me to become a mother because of this condition that I have that happened because Monsanto, a.k.a. Bear, a.k.a. the people that made Agent Orange, decided to put that crap everywhere, and it got into my dad's system and essentially poisoned all his daughters, except for, like, one. And... It's frustrating because when you get into reproductive rights and people with disabilities, it seems like to be some sort of does not compute situation because on one hand, they're like, what do you want kids for? You can't take care of them. I'm not able to adopt children right now because they'll say you're unqualified to adopt because you, you can't take care of a child because you have a disability yourself. It's very often within parenting and things like that, they'll use the fact that you have a disability or a mental health condition against you in terms of custody and all sorts of other things. And I know Amanda has a couple of stories about that too. It's, it's ridiculous what people with disability of, disabilities in this country have to deal with. From children to adults, it's, it's, it hurts and it honestly makes me very sad. And even in looking at the legislation that people think are perfectly well suited for us, people don't sit down and think what different parts of legislation mean when someone's disabled. Like I see a lot of people who say that, you know, red flag laws are necessary. I've seen red flag laws be used as a justification to prevent all sorts of things. Red flag laws have been used to put people on lists who are disabled because they had one interaction with a teacher that might be seen as aggressive. So one of the things that I would say to almost anyone is, you know, take a look at any law that you're advocating for and think, how would this affect someone else? Um, one of the other things that I 
advocate for as a member of the Green Party is the implementation of how our Green New Deal setup actually is designed for that integration. The Green New Deal housing policies that are espoused by the Green Party and I hope will be adopted by other people specifically speak on the need for like multi-class housing situations where you have mixed you have consistent like mixed I don't want to say mixed market because that's the wrong word mixed usage housing that is you have your people that are disabled living next to in the same building as, as people that are not disabled people that are you know in uh, managerial executive type positions living right next door to people that might own bodegas or be co-op owners of bodegas or work you know normal nine to five jobs etc this kind of societal integration that's called for in the disability integration act of 20 2020 2019 they keep not passing it so the n number's going to keep changing these sort of things are you know advocated in how greens would like to see society change because everyone needs to be truly included i'm trying to think if there's anything i have forgotten Ooh, without getting into the without getting into older pieces of legislation no i haven't forgotten anything but um oh and with regard to the psych with the regard to the use of studying of things that are making for us healthier i i speak as a person with cerebral palsy i can tell you right now they stop studying children with cerebral palsy the minute we turn 19. there is no data to tell me what I should expect growing up as now a 28 year old disabled person. I also just need to say that I'm frustrated with the entire state of our medical system because whenever something happens to you, if you have a dis disability, they assume it's because of your disability. Example, as I was telling Amanda earlier, I had some liver and gallbladder issues that were happening during my campaign. I didn't know that was the situation because it manifested itself by my feet itching uncontrollably and not being able to walk and swelling and blah, 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 blah. They said, oh, it's something wrong with your feet, so we're going to assume it's an infection. They never checked my blood for any kind of liver dysfunction. And I had to find out that there was liver dysfunction and gallbladder blockages after getting a third or fourth freaking CT scan. Um, they assume that every pain I have is because I have cerebral palsy. No, every pain I have is not because I have cerebral palsy. I was denied necessary physical therapy for an injury that I suffered around my 22nd birth, no, 23rd birthday. I had a couple injuries, so. I fell out of a porta potty once because I decided to go camping around my 25th birthday. And, well, I hurt my hip with like it, something pulled. And it was a pain that made it impossible for me to walk for like a good year and a half. I was walking with a different kind of limp than I have normally. And the doctor recognized that something was wrong because there was a CT scan and MRI done. But, and my doctor sent me to a specialist because it was, they figured out how to make it covered. And the specialist was like, I'm begging Medicaid to let me give you this physical therapy. I'm begging them, they keep saying no, they keep saying no, they keep saying no. I just did the research on exactly what happened and I'm gonna have permanent issues with like certain areas of my bladder because of the thing, because of one small pull of the muscle in my pelvis that would have been completely avoidable if within six months or sorry if within six weeks within two weeks of this treatment plan being implemented if they had been able to give me the physical therapy i'm never gonna not be in pain in this area because they denied treatment for something and this happens so often to so many people i'm not trying to make anything about me i'm just trying to help you have a example of what it is we're dealing with they try to dismiss you or infantilize you because you have a disability. They want to blame anything that ever could possibly be wrong with you from the sky being the wrong color on your disability. They don't want to see you as a whole person that needs like to have your entire body treated. I also once had a couple of situations where I thought I was having some ear issues and the doctor did this. 
and spoke to me like this to try to prove to me that, you know, there's nothing wrong with your ears. And I'm like, see, this is why nobody likes doctors. And I don't want to feel like that. But when you feel like doctors are discarding you, it's hard for you to trust medical professionals. I have, uh, I have no choice but to, because if I don't try to trust them a little, I'm going to just be in pain and hurting for the rest of my life. <laughs> yeah, eugenics is real. And oh, Speaking of eugenics, in Los Angeles, because we're having protests, the mayor closed down our COVID testing centers, which essentially creates a situation where, well, we're not going to know if we have the COVID-19 because they decided to not test. It's already harder for people with disabilities to get this test, and they're just going to, what? If they have the coronavirus, they just have the coronavirus and we're going to let the poorest die seems to be the general consensus of a lot of people. That's why I strive for and scream about accountability so often. That's why I'm nitpicky about votes and nitpicky about budgets, because I see you saying one thing, elected official, and you're doing another and I can prove it. So I'm not going to give you credit for saying the right thing when you're doing the wrong thing. If that makes me an a-hole, I apologize. I think that about covers it for now. I just want to go back and echo really quickly something you just said at the beginning, and I think people can never hear it too many times, that this is the only state of being that you can acquire. That has power, and people need to remember that, and they need to keep it in mind, and they need to do something. Um, so um, thank you very much. We'll come back. We have lots of questions. So we're going to go next to Liam Amara. Um, and he's going to share, the professor of the history of ideas with us, he's going to share some thoughts with us. Hi. Uh, thanks. Um, hello again. Uh, Liam Amara for Congress, CA42. Um, usually I take these opportunities to um, pound on some progressive policy idea that I have, and I want to do it a little bit differently today. I'm going to use my time to relate a couple of stories from uh, my own life, um, because doing better by the people in this country is personal for me. But I, I want to start by thanking our two guests this afternoon for their thoughts and ideas. We have got to do better in this country, and listening to these two progressive warriors is a step along the way to that. Okay, so um, I'll... I'll start with the easier one. I was an uh, odd duck as a kid, you can say. I started talking and reading uh, very young and never stopped. I, uh, I spent my recesses at school sitting on the bench reading classic fiction, philosophy, history, blah, blah, blah. But I had a number of uh, emotional issues along the way too. Um, I could not relate to others or understand what was expected of me socially. And I had a lot of difficulty managing the speed of my thoughts and the physical energy that I felt. They actually wanted to hold me back in the second grade and only chose not to because they tested my intelligence, so to speak, and decided that would be a disservice to me. We never did get any help from the schools and the therapies my mother tried uh, never helped either because their assumptions about the causes were all wrong. I had to sort all this stuff out myself and did so, but there has to be a better way. And earlier intervention and things could save a lot of wasted potential in our society. Because what my experience and that of so many other people with whom I've spoken and about which I've read has taught me that folks who Folks naturally have different approaches to thinking, and that's all right. As a society, we've gotten better at identifying a lot of these, but there's still a tendency to, I think, pathologize and seek to cure everything when what some folks need are just reasonable accommodations and a bit of flexibility and approach. And from the vantage point of watching the kids my mother served in her decades running a child care center, I saw plenty of positive developments in the schools across the street, but far too few from my perspective. And stripping resources from the public schools has not helped. We don't need private charter schools. We need to give our public schools the resources to help more kids to succeed. I think we heard earlier about um, integrating classrooms and, and how that can help as well. It helps to breed a lot of tolerance as well. So finding ways to, to, to do that, to increase the amount of training and resources available to teachers would really help. Um, 
And I can't help thinking that there are a lot of people who would really benefit from a lot of those earlier interventions and from help in the schooling uh, to help them find their own ways of learning and their own ways of growing. And that if we could take less of a, a one size fits all way of schooling, we might benefit more as a society and fewer people would fall through the cracks. Okay, so uh, deep breath. The other issue I wanna raise is a bit harder for me. Uh, so please be patient. And if tales of severe mental illness bother you, this is a polite trigger warning. At, uh, at age 22, um, I married my childhood best friend. Um, we knew by then that she had serious issues with depression and had already had two suicide attempts. And I thought that I could be there for her, offer a stabilizing presence and that we'd do all right. I could not have been more wrong about the outcome and its ending is still painful for me. Less than two years into the marriage, um, she suffered her first psychotic break. Over the following years, she fell more and more often into them, uh, into paranoid delusions, talking to God and to aliens, feeling herself alternately controlled by and experimented upon by them. She's uh, schizoaffective, which is sort of a midway point between uh, bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And it means that she has all the ups and downs of manic depressive disorder, but her manias veer into dangerous psychoses. So I spent my 20s and early 30s doing the best I could to care for her um, as her needs grew more and more um, involved and, uh, and time consuming and being constantly jerked around throughout by uh, the health insurance companies and by the government. We we really struggled to get her social security disability in the first place as it was the only way we could find to to ensure that she even had decent coverage um and we and to keep her covered but even that failed um, we had constantly to recertify the condition as though she was somehow magically going to change her neurology uh, but you know you know, one time we got direct permission in advance from the Social Security Administration that she could work a few hours a week at my mother's child care center. This is her mother-in-law. Obviously, it'd be a controlled environment for her. We figured that would give her a sense of, like, dignity and purpose. Um, and we let them know that that was the situation she was going into. And they assured us it would not do anything. It would change nothing. She would keep all of her benefits. But as soon as she got her first paycheck, they canceled her insurance and left her with no therapist and no medication. Predictably, she ended up being hospitalized yet again. This sort of thing happens because the American approach to care is often predicated on a desire to deny services. Bureaucrats, whether working for private corporations or the federal government, are tasked with getting people off of benefits instead of ensuring that the best possible care is provided. Now, uh, my wife went through several more suicide attempts on uh, one notable occasion being an ICU with a 10% chance to live. Um, and I, I got to say, having to make arrangements for the outcome was difficult, to say the least. And about twice a year, like virtual clockwork, she would cycle into severe psychotic behavior, begin talking about how she had to get rid of the people who would hold her back on her mission, this sort of thing. Um, she would just disappear at random and we would spend time hunting for her. And, you know, you can't file missing persons reports until people are gone for a while. And oftentimes that's a little late. You know, at one point she got in her car, hopped on uh, the Hollywood freeway headed north and kept driving until she ran out of fuel on the freeway. And the car rolled backward and slammed into another car. Um, and then um, police got there and not knowing what to do. I mean, they turned their backs and she wandered away and she was missing for another couple of days. They later finally found her trying to levitate ping pong balls on the train tracks so the trains would hit them and it would send the messages somewhere. I, don't, I mean, but I mean, these things can be very dangerous, you know, and, and it's like, it was such a struggle to get even the most basic care for her. And I, memories of a lot of these years can really sting, still bring back a lot for me. Now, in a lot of some of the present protests, I'd like to mention that police are often called in as first responders for mental health issues, and they seldom have the right training for it. Um, I could tell you horror stories from uh, our experiences there, but 
I'm not sure I could do so without a lot of that pain and anger really coming to the top for me. So I'm, I'm going to leave it at that. But we definitely can do better. And what frustrates me endlessly about situations like this and about a lot of mental disabilities is that many people with her diagnosis have normal and fulfilling lives. You know, uh, but and I, I can't help thinking that about how differently things may have turned out for her if we'd had a good system of universal health care and if appropriate steps have been taken along the way to help her find her path forward. Too many families instead suffer the heartbreak and misery that ours did and too many brilliant and wonderful people lose their way and have their dreams cruelly snuffed out by circumstances that are completely beyond their control. I want to believe that we can do better. I want to believe that in the richest country in history, we can offer to our citizens a standard of living worthy of that status. We have the highest rate of poverty in the developed world and the worst safety net by far, which means that people with special needs often suffer far more than should have been the case. Offering healthcare to everyone is a no brainer. Offering reasonable accommodations so that people can live their best lives is also a big duh for me. And it costs far less for a society to offer appropriate care since we waste so much human potential. We have got to do better in reforming our approach to disability rights and improving our healthcare and social services are the best first steps we can take. So thanks for your time. Thank you very much. Um, so we have a number of things that we can cover, but uh, um, what I want to do today is I want to start with making sure that people really understand some of these subjects and where you're coming from, and I want to challenge you all to, in the end, give us something that we can do. What can, who we, someone we can call, something we can, um, you know, we can research more and learn about it in ourselves so we can be more educated. Push us, because you have this audience out here, and there's a lot of us, and we should be able to do something. So I want to challenge you to that, but first, I want to back up and I'm going to talk about something that um, is a very simple thing but I don't think a, a lot of people um, really know about these things. So we've heard references to reasonable accommodations. We've heard references to EAPs. If I can please have a little bit of a definition of what they are and how they, um, they, and how they work. You don't have to go into incredible detail but just so people are all on the same page. either one or anything from there that you want to talk about. So all, all right, sorry. Uh, so reasonable accommodation is just the ability to function in a regular setting. Um, it's the ability to have an aid in class for a student so that they can have that help uh, writing or reading or uh, whatever they need that extra little bit of assistance with, but it doesn't remove them from a regular class. You know, it keeps them as part of society just with a little bit of extra help. Um, an IEP is uh, an individual, oh no, I'm going to forget my letters now. Uh, where is Liz when you need her? An okay. IEP is an... I think it was... Uh, an individual development plan, right? Uh, I think I may be right, maybe not. Something kind of like that. I can't remember what the, but basically what it is, is it's a plan that the student and the parents and the teachers all work together to create so that every student that is on one of these IEPs can have a expectation of what is expected from them. The parents know what is expected of their student and of the teacher. Everybody knows their assigned roles. They all know what they are working forward and they have a plan, a reasonable plan tailored specifically to that student and that family so that they can go forward. And those plans are really indispensable, so. It's a, a individual um, education program, um, and <clears throat> what it does is, yeah, it, exactly, it, it tailors the, the circumstances there. Um, I got to talk through uh, putting one of these together for um, my, my partner who lives up in, uh, in New York, um, and uh, her daughter's autistic, so you're she they would have to like work out okay how is how is schooling going to work what what services are going to be available and you know however they can help out there so 
having some kind of like tailoring really can help provided sufficient resources are given to the different programs that can do it. Right. And one program that's talked about a little less is similar to the IEP, but it's called a 504 plan. And that's for something where a student might have a condition or disability that where they might not necessarily need an aid, but they need to have certain accommodations made with regard to how much time they have to do their work or what have you. An example, again, is a couple of my nieces have epilepsy, and because the way the medication sets up, there's just times where even though they're homeschooled, they cannot be in class because sleeping or because that, if you have a seizure the previous day and it's a full body seizure, the next day you have trouble moving or getting up. If you have to take emergency medicine, you can't school that day. The 504 plan being written the way that it's written to give your teachers an idea of the sorts of accommodations and needs that you have after an episode like this allows for you to better have the time you need as a student to get what you need done and allows to prevent that frustration that parents and teachers have when a really bright student is not able to meet their full potential otherwise. These programs, they exist and they help they help students. I think it seems to me in my lived experience, an IEP and a 504 plan are very much a similar thing, but 504 plans are for students that were not placed into special ed. You've talked, you talked Chanel about the advantage or the, the helpfulness of having a plan early on in school, right? And how it was beneficial. Can you share a little bit more about that? Yeah, sure, no problem. One of the things, I'll give you a perfect example. I have cerebral palsy, so I had a, there was a time when anytime I touched a pencil, my hands would physically burn. And because I couldn't like use a wooden pencil and I was having issues with my dexterity, they were like, well, let's see if we can get, help this child get information out better with the computer. They gave me my first laptop at like age nine. And for that reason, I've been typing at like 200 and something words a minute since I was 10 because they gave me a laptop to use for school that had a program that read the information I typed back to me, which helped my understanding of reading comprehension and what have you, so that it would be easier for me to keep up with the rest of my peers as I was a mainstream disabled kid. Um, I had the, the legal paper that you, the transfer paper that other people could write my notes on and give to me because I wasn't able to write them otherwise. Simple things like that. Even for like, even for certain standardized tests, I would get more time because I couldn't physically bubble in the things. Things like that make it clear that even though I don't move as fast as the next student might, it, does, it shouldn't necessarily too much affect what I'm able to do in this class because I have, I know what I'm doing. It's just that, you know, I'm physically incapable of doing this thing or that thing is kind of the only real example that I have for my own experience that clarifies that for you. Because I mean, without the reasonable accommodations that I got, having gone to the schools that I went to, when I got to middle school and high school, I know that I would not have had the skills required to keep up to the way that I did. I'm not calling myself an honor roll student by any means, but I, but if I hadn't had the, here's how you're learning to type and this is how you do this that, and the other type of training that I got as a child that I was able to keep using, it would have been so much harder for me to finish school, not because I couldn't do it, but because the pain of having to write or get some of this stuff done like manually, it wouldn't have been, I wouldn't have been able to do it. I would have gave up because it was too hard. People with CP have a low frustration tolerance anyway. And, and just for um, some, more, some more audience, since a lot of our examples here of reasonable accommodation have come about through like you know, schooling or youth, I want to point out that this is something that lasts through your entire life and affects just everything. It really is about providing a basic standard of living. Uh, think about how many buildings just are not accessible to people because there are only stairs. I mean, you know, that, that's a reasonable accommodation. 
right? You know, just simply providing access. I mean, it, it's something as simple as like a little bump in a threshold can literally stop someone from coming into your business, even if it's on the, the first floor. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's tons of ways in which we can do better at, you know, allowing more people to participate in society. And that's really what we're after there. So let's talk about that a little bit more. Amanda, early on, you mentioned the ADA loopholes, grandfathering, and the ability for people to access things. Can you share a little bit more, educate us on that subject? Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me. If you look around, like this last uh, December, we had a, an event here in Portland, Oregon, where we took uh, state, local, and congressional representatives or candidates and put them in wheelchairs and took them around Portland to show them what we were talking about. Because when you have those little wheelchair cutout ramps going up sidewalks, a lot of times they're either too steep or they have giant pit holes at the bottom where they fill with water. And, you know, these types of problems are things that you can't necessarily see when you are out and about just walking around. You're like, oh, look, there's a wheelchair cut out. That's awesome. But you don't realize that those giant pit holes at the bottom keep people from using them. Or that the, uh, the little bump, like Liam said, at the top of a ramp can prevent a wheelchair from entering. Or our Oregon, or I'm sorry, our Multnomah Democrats building, they have a technically wheelchair accessible building, but the parking lot to get up to it is at such a steep angle that you can't get into it. Um, I mean, bathrooms, bathrooms are huge. And then you go into a bathroom, if you're lucky enough to have a place that has a wheelchair accessible bathroom, and all the wheelchair, the one wheelchair stall that you can use is now occupied by able-bodied people because they would like more room. I mean, we need to do better. All those stalls open should the be door able to the bathroom. <laughs> right? I mean, how many of those wheelchair stalls have the doors put on backwards so you can't even get into the stall with a wheelchair? I mean, there are so many problems out there right now that people don't even realize because they look and they're like, oh, look, there, there's a ramp. They don't realize that it's that big. Or, oh, look, there's a one handicap spot and re don't realize that there's 50 handicapped people fighting for that one handicap spot. I mean, we are out here. There are so many of us. The right. only reason that people don't see us is because we, uh, we live in an inaccessible society. There are shops that I can't go in in Portland because there are stairs. Uh, I am lucky to find a bathroom downtown Portland. I, if I go shopping, I'm really, really lucky if there are people around that can like help me out because I can't get stuff off the top shelf. We can't look over the deli counter. You know, I mean, around the universally, it's just, we don't consider these things when we're, we're, making businesses when we're putting in housing when we're you know baking our streets or anything else we don't consider those with disabilities and that's why we really need to adapt universal design right i'll give you another example with regard to the cutouts i'm fortunate because i live in an area where i can walk out my door like down my stairs out of my place to go to a hub where there are buses. But if you're pressing that crosswalk symbol to go to the left or to the right, you have to press the crosswalk symbol, but the ramp that you would use to get down that street is like a whole, like maybe three and a half feet away. And the time it takes me to press that button and then walk to where I'm supposed to to get safely down off that ramp, the light changes. I, I had a whole, almost complete nervous breakdown back in February because I was trying to go wash clothes because the laundromat isn't far. But every time I went to press that button, I had my little buggy with me of clothes trying to do it myself 
because I really wanted to do it myself because I, there was no one here to take me to the laundromat. And every single time I pressed that button in the time it would take me to get to where I needed to be in order to safely go across the street, the light would change or I'd have to make a choice between holding my laundry cart so it wouldn't roll into the street or just not being able to go across the street. I remember I got so frustrated. I sat down on the bus stop and I cried and I made a live stream because I didn't know what to do and I was frustrated. And people don't even think about these things. I mean, I wish there was a way to make the ADA retroactive in a way that forces cities to literally go through with a fine tooth comb exactly how inaccessible it is and like either fines or reprimands them until they fix it because it's very obvious with the design of los angeles east los angeles because that's where i live and most of the city of the county of los angeles and most of california that nobody thought about us when they built these places i don't mean to be so angry but I had just like almost fallen off a bus that day. Like a bus hit my back because I, the thing you talked about with the, the divots, they actually stopped the bus on a, on a ramp curb and I went to get off the bus and it was too low. So I ended up falling hitting my back on the bus. And yeah, I got, I still have the medical bill for that because they insisted on x-raying my back, but I can't pay this medical bill. So I guess it's in collections now. You don't have to be angry if they're if they would do things the right way and design it the right way so that you wouldn't get injured. Um, I mean, it's not just about designing it the right way. It's about educating those that put it in yeah. so that they know the proper way to do it. And that's where education it comes back to education because a lot of those people that are construction workers or you know the um, the people that are actually out there doing the work, they've never experienced this. They have no idea. They just think that they're doing a great job by putting in the cutout. They don't really understand that it has to be a certain angle or they don't really understand that these are people's lives that are being affected when you put in a wheel or a handicapped door upside down so that it bashes into the chair and you can't get a wheelchair into that stall. You know, they just never even think about it because they don't have to deal with it. It comes back to nothing about us without us. Like, do you know how many disabled people would have good paying jobs if they hired us to be consultants on this construction or anything, really? There are so many communities that are just hurt because people don't think to talk to them, to say, I see your value as a, a resource of information. Can you tell me more about what you're going through? How might we be able to design and create in a way that accommodates for your needs? I recognize that your disability might be the same as the next person's, but individual matters. So let's hear more of that. That's why I'm so frustrated about the fact that there's that they stopped studying children with cerebral palsy at age 19. Because if they hadn't, I would have a better sense of how to manage the horrible pain that I get to be in now because no one told me that you're not supposed to take freaking incense for the rest of your life or something. So um, I wanna end on um, with the, the last question, which is, an, um, Kind of a sensitive one, but I feel like it's really, 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 I want to say timely, but I think it's always been a problem. Um, and I, I apologize, Liam, I'm just going to warn you that we're going to go there a little bit. I want to talk a little bit, a few of you have talked about policing services, um, caregivers, the proper placement of who should be dealing with some of these services, and some of the policing who are dealing poorly <laughs> with them and in a failed manner. Um, and especially right now where we're having so many concerns, I apologize everyone. You don't have to share if you want to, but if you, you do choose to share, just a little bit about what we sh where, where we should be having our care and what's wrong with what we're doing now. Oh. Chanel's sister, yeah. you wanna go? Oh, well, oh I'll of course. I or mean, Liam? unless you want All right, to- Liam. Liam, I'm sorry, man, you're, you're up, man. Yeah, you go first. Oh, whichever. I mean, 
Okay. Well, the, um, the first one that occurs to me with um, police um, and as it deals again with, um, with mental disabilities, because in my family, that's my bigger exposure here. Um, one of, one of her suicide attempts, um, the police were first on the scene and they asked what she had taken because she downed an entire bottle and she told them, you know, and they looked at the bottle and said, okay, well, that's fine. And they sent her home. And um, fortunately, we noticed her like being violently sick late that night and rushed her to an emergency room and they managed to get to it in time, but she had taken a lethal dose. If she had actually managed to fall asleep, she would have died that night. And that wasn't even one of our closer calls, but that only became a close call specifically because the people responding on the scene were not properly trained for it. And there was no requirement that they bring people onto the scene who were better trained or who would have known what to do. And I mean, there are just so many places like this where just a little bit more sensitivity would have helped. And I don't know how many stories we've seen in the national media about people being beaten or even shot by police for things that were completely out of their control because they had no idea what they were dealing with. And they're called in as, as first responders in these kind of situations. If that's what we're going to do, then they have to be properly trained. I agree with a lot of that, but I mean, one of the other things that we really got to start doing, control of the police should not be in the hands of some amorphous, not part of the community group of people. We've already seen through the Stanford experiment that some people get a little power hungry and seek any excuse to abuse people when they have that opportunity. Community control of the police is something that we need. We need... Well, personally, I don't exactly think that police are a thing that should happen, but for as long as they exist, we need to have police coming from the communities in which they serve. They need to come from the communities that they serve. They need to be trained to not shoot first, ask questions later. If a cop is coming from the community in which they serve, then they're likely to have, you know, that memory, that understanding of the community to not get like spooked because, you know, one family might be having a game of like dominoes or spades or uno or whatever, and they just get loud because, you know, it's an intense game. They would know that this particular couple just kind of argues loud. It's their thing. They, they're not abusing each other because, you know, these are my neighbors and I know who they are. When you have most of the police in certain, in most police situations coming from like two cities over to police an area, they're not going to get the culture. They're not going to get the community. They're not going to know who the people they're supposedly serving are. I mean, community control and oversight of the police is absolutely necessary. The oversight commissions that exist right now for our policing situation is seems to not have very little to do with the needs and opinion of the people. I mean, in LA, our police commission literally passed a rule that said they have over a year to be able to show you video from police dash cams and they're allowed to edit it if they want to. There's a reason I'm a member of the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition. And one of it is because I see the bull crap that is the LAPD and most of the policing situations in my city. And I don't like what I see. So that definitely, that has to change first and foremost. We need to be able to regulate and have authority over these policing, policing bodies as citizens because also qualified immunity has got to go. And those cameras exist for a reason. When people turn them off before going into somewhere, that should be grounds for immediate termination because you know they're thinking about something if they're turning it off before they walk in. There's a reason we passed the laws to create them in the first place. And there's no accountability if they can turn them off themselves and if they can tamper with the footage afterwards. 
I mean, one thing we definitely need to do is with society as a whole is educate the police, you know? Police have no idea how to deal with disabilities. They don't know that they can't just grab our wheelchairs and fling us around because they don't deal with us. They don't see us. They don't interact with us other than to be that authoritarian figure. Um, we need them to realize that we are just as human as they are. I mean, I was at a protest. Um, I guess this woman was back in August and I was trying to get around a, to go around a corner and there was a line of police there and I was trying to get them to, you know, just kind of let me by and they're like, no, get off the thing and go into the street and go all the way around and then get back up on the curb and then go. And they, when I explained them that I can't just take my wheelchair down and up a curb, it's not that easy. They said that, oh, well, we saw you standing up earlier, so you should be able to do it, no problem. And it was just, are you, are you freaking kidding me? Like, how do they not get this? It's, that's why it's so important to have community policing and to have people that know us and interact with us as the police force because when you don't, that's what happens. You get that, that stigma, you get that horrible interaction, you get that bias, you get that whatever, you know? I mean, it needs to change. Bottom down, top up, all across the board, it's just done. The way we're doing it isn't work, it's done. But, but Amanda, we've all seen pictures of, of FDR standing at the podium, haven't we? So we know he didn't really need that wheelchair, of course. Oh, man, the fact that mm -hmm. some people just don't get that everybody in a wheelchair can, you know, we can sometimes move our legs. We can sometimes stand up occasionally. Not everybody in a wheelchair is in a wheelchair 100% of the time, guys. Substitute stupid question. And it's stupid question, I guarantee you. Who gets to decide who has an invisibility? The disabled person. Exactly. So we just want to make sure people have that note. Um, it's not something for us to diagnose. Just because you see somebody on the street, just because, you know, even if they can get up and walk around, doesn't mean you can tell them they don't have a disability. So, um, so now we're going to go to, uh, to last thought. <laughs> um, well, just reminds me of, of like the constant desire to push people off too, because that's again, society taking this authoritarian position saying, well, you're not really disabled. You should go get a job or whatever here. It, it makes no sense. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean it, it's your turn, Liam. So we're going to have you go first and then we're going to have, um, we're going to have, I'm going to make sure I'm exactly in the right order. And then Chanel and then Amanda. Last thoughts, go ahead. It uh, looks like, uh, yeah, we did lose Liz. Okay, so um, in just closing, I want to reiterate my full-throated support for uh, Amanda's Disability Rights Platform. I'm glad that a lot of other people have been picking it up and are talking about this more often because these are issues that need to be talked about. And, you know, Chanel was saying, oh, I apologize for getting angry a little while ago. No, you should not have, you should not apologize for getting angry. We should all angry and if we all got a bit angry about the treatment of our fellow citizens maybe we would get something done in this country i want to thank both of our, both of our guests for for raising these issues and for coming on to this and um, i'd like to urge people to demand more from our society so that fewer people have to suffer in silence and neglect and we can all thrive together amanda oh no chanel i'm sorry it's okay um I just want to once again thank you guys for having me. Um, I feel kind of odd person out a little bit because I am an abolitionist and I'm very militant about the things that I don't find okay. I know that there are places where we can always come together on issues of right and wrong, of access and need. So I'm gonna just say that we need to look at 
all angles of this thing as best we can. There's no one size fits all solution to any of the problems we discussed here, but we need all the voices heard. And honestly, one of the best things that you can do for yourself if you wanna learn more information in regards to how these things are affecting people as far as policing goes, yeah, you should probably check out the Stop LAPD Spine Coalition because if you did, if you looked into that a little bit, you would start to see how these things are connected. And it's it's pretty wild when you go down that rabbit hole. Um, as a disability rights advocate, I also like to say, be very careful in supporting things related to algorithmic policing as a whole. The reason that I, implore everyone I know that's running to fight for the repeal of FOSTA SESTA is because even if you're not a sex worker's rights advocate or a sex worker, I'm a sex worker's right advocate, not a sex worker, um, you have to know that the way that these laws are designed create a situation where we as disabled people can't speak on the things that happen to us because the the statistics for sexual abuse of people that are disabled particularly young people are horrible and i don't really want to get into it that bad but for me of 10 friends only two of us have not experienced that and you're not able on the internet to speak freely about those experiences in safe spaces anymore because FOSTA was passed and the way that they it the way that the computer polices language makes it impossible for you to tell your story or even get resources. The, be mindful of the fact that laws that exist that are othering those people can negatively affect you. Do not wait until you see the effects of, say, FOSTA taking down Tinder for you to care about it. Care now. Ask questions now. Always ask questions and always be aware. Thank you so much for having me here. Love you both. Yeah, Amanda. All right, so I just wanna say that disability rights are human rights. And if you are gonna be a human rights activist, it's not just about fighting for Black Lives Matter. It's not just about fighting for women. It's not just about fighting for the LGBTQ. It's not just about fighting for immigrants. It's about fighting for all of us. The big us includes all of us. It includes the disabled, it includes us. And we need to do better as a society of ensuring that all people have the care, the ability to live and the functionality that they need to survive and live a quality life. Uh, never in this country or in this world has segregation worked and we need to stop acting like it does. Segregation for this community but not that community is not okay. Segregation across the board needs to be done with. We need to do better including people to give people the ability to live with dignity and that's all we all need to live with dignity and a basic quality of life Dil disability rights are human rights and we need to do better all right thank you everyone um thank you everyone at home uh and out there for joining us and for everyone viewing us later on so next saturday we'll be talking about universal basic income and the new war on poverty we have two special guests with us david kim in ca34 and james ellers from forward united and then we want to ask you all to continue to stay safe continue to stay thinking um keep take some of these items you've heard about today and uh, take the challenge to become more educated and let's all do it together okay um have a great evening